with us worshiping this morning. I'm glad you're on Facebook watching us this morning. I truly do believe, again, that God has us in this series for a reason. What He has us been preaching about and, and, and discussing this entire year, I think, has truly really been leading us up. Because I do believe a time is coming when our faith is really going to be tested. Uh, where, because I, we do know that Jesus himself said in, in Matthew chapter 24 that when, when the end days are coming, when the end times are coming, that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. It's possible for even possibly the very elect. So, so again, we, we need to make sure we never believe what we think we know and all that stuff. We need to constantly be taking in the Word of God, receiving knowledge, as much knowledge as we can, and just really have ourselves prepared and, and just be ready. Um, because I'm telling you, um, there may be some things coming our way that we thought we would never... Again, I know things are coming our way that we thought we would never see in our lifetime. And... Uh, and just understand, don't let these things shake you. Don't let they worry you. Don't let they move. If they move you to anything, let them move you to prayer. Amen. If they move you, let them move you to a closer walk with your Lord Jesus Christ. Um, that, that's how you But don't let them move you to a place where you become distraught or, or fret or worried about yourself. Because truly remember who God is and who you are in Jesus. And I, and I do think that's why he's really had us deal with a lot of things this year so far that we have dealt with. That because of Jesus, the certainties that we can stand on because of Jesus. And we dealt with who is Jesus to remind us that Jesus truly is. He is the Messiah. And that, that we're going through now. How do I know? How how can I have an, an, an intelligence? Again, I know it all. everything we talk about boils down to faith. But how can we have an, an intelligent faith of why we believe what we believe? And I dealt with that over the last two weeks when we dealt with, does God exist? How do I know God exists? And today we're going to deal with a thought going down this that line a little bit about some things that a lot of people in the world know some things about. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let's go ahead and, and do this. Like I said, we're continuing our series about how do I know. Because again, as I told you each and every week, in your walk of faith, in your Christian walk, there are going to be people who approach you and say, why do you believe that? Or what do you believe? Or whatever. And the Bible tells us that we should be ready to give an answer for that. Um, Peter, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, he says, Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. Not just to say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus and I know I'm going to heaven. But, but you notice what he says there. Be ready to Explain it. Now that, that doesn't mean you have to go out and go to college and go to seminary and get a theological degree so, so you can sit there and, and lay out a certain amount of points. You know, I'm just I'm trying to give you a knowledgeable faith to where again the information's out there. And I want to give you some, some information that when people say, why do you believe this? So we do know, we do know that when you know they, certain things happen, we know as being children of God that the Holy Spirit will move upon us and bring things to our remembrance. But he can only bring things to your remembrance that get put in this brain of ours. So hence the reason why we were talking about this. And again, I did, actually, I looked at, I, we did speak on this subject probably about eight years ago. And, uh, but I just felt the need to, to really deal with these thoughts again. And, and, and even, even, even just maybe in some different other ways. Um, but we should be ready to be able to explain about our Christian hope, why we have hope as followers of Jesus Christ. And again, this verse is the reason for this series. Um, as I said, you know, when we when we hit these questions, here are some of the questions we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna look at. We looked at this one already. How do I know God exists? Today we're gonna be dealing with this this one. Is the Bible reliable? Is it too narrow to say that Jesus is the only way to God? And we're going to do with other questions like that. These questions that sometimes people, you're like, please don't ask me, because I, I really don't know. And, but I want, again, you're not, these aren't going to be in all you can know about the subject, because um, even the ones who wrote books on these don't know all you can know about the subject. The only one who knows all you can know about the subject is God. And one great thing is because of God and, and, and the, God the Holy Spirit, when He comes to reside with us, he, the Bible says he teaches us about Christ. He, bring, he brings things to our remembrance, but he also teaches things. 
So when you dive into the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will move upon you to help reveal things to you, but, but you must have a desire, you must take the initiative to do that. The, the same as you're, you're here today. So, so, so you're here to receive a word, so, so, so God is honored by that, so receive it and let it truly take root in your heart and in your mind. Like I said, in each week I told you I will share with you um, where I got my information from. Today, today I was mainly dealing with Josh McDowell's website. Um, I will tell you, uh, if, if you're not a person who likes to read, you like to just listen, if you actually go on there and you click on his website, you type in his name, Josh McDowell, will take you there. You can look over, it'll say resources, and I think on the resources it says videos. Or, or it may just say videos. Right? But, but they're listed, they're broken down in categories. In fact, is when we're dealing with what we're going to deal with today, how do we know the Word of God is reliable? I think he has like 20 videos on there. And they range, they're anywhere from like uh, three minutes to maybe five or ten minutes long. Uh, and, uh, and again, just, just a real brief thing about Josh McDowell. You, you, he'll say about this a little bit in the video I'm going to show you here in a minute. Um, he actually started out uh, trying to disprove Christianity. He went to college, and while he was at college, he saw these group of people running around declaring Jesus. And he, and, and he, he didn't believe in Jesus. He, 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 was, he was either agnostic or I think he actually says he was an atheist, but he didn't like this. So, so he decided what he was going to do was he was going to arm himself with ammunition to destroy their faith. His goal was, 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 to, was to go and find all the, 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 the errors, the inconsistencies, and everything about the Christian faith. And then when, when one of these Christian people approached him, he would let them have it. And just literally destroy their faith. But in the process, what happened was when he began to really look at the scriptures and research it, and really check this one named Jesus, he turned from an atheist to a believer. And he, and he is now, I mean, for years, Josh McDowell has, has ministered to young people trying to, to, to help them understand the, the, that, that the Bible is reliable, that Jesus Christ is real, that he's more than just a carpenter. That's the name of one of his books. Um, he, has a lot of, he has a lot of good books out there. So, again, I want to encourage you to check his website out. Again, check out Lee Strobel's website. When he talks about a case for Christ, a case for the Creator. Check out uh, Randall Niles' website. And, Listen to talks from Robbie Zacharias, just name a few, and John Lennox again. I'll name him again. These are some highly intelligent and far more intelligent than I am. And, uh, and, and, and these are individuals who will literally go to uh, the halls of academia and, and present their side of the argument. And very rarely, if ever, do they ever get run off the stage. Um, so these are some good men to follow and to listen to. And to go to get your information from. Like I said, today we're dealing with the second question that, that, that I named up there. Is the Bible reliable? How do I know if the Bible is reliable? And we want to deal with that today. You know, because you know, when we start talking about something, you know, someone may approach and say, hey, buddy, you know, it seems like every single time I ask you a question, all you ever do is quote this book named the Bible. What in the world makes you think that that is the last word of authority on all issues, you know, because we we already we already know that that, that that scientists and other people have proven that the Bible it, it is not reliable, that that it is not true, um, and it's full of contradictions and it's full of errors. Why in the world are you trusting in this book? Because historians and scientists, folks, like I said, have already declared it to be false in all of this. See, because many people are of the opinion that the teaching of the Bible are outdated. I mean, but here's the thing. God's Word is, is, is eternal. Truth, truth is always the truth, no matter the day, the air, the time. It, it, it's always the truth. They believe it's outdated. They believe it's contradictory and full of scientific and historical errors. With few exceptions, they have reached these conclusions through second-hand or third-hand sources rather than their own study of the Bible. In other words, they're taking even old arguments that are out there. Instead of doing the research themselves and seeing if there's anything more new out there about it, they, they're relying on things that could be 100 to 150, 200 years old. A lot of things I'm going to show you today are, are talking about today, are, have been, the video I'm going to show you was done within at least the last 10 years. So, 
And, and each time that they really try, they go and they dive into the Bible to check things out about it. The more they research it and these things, um, the more it proves that it is reliable. I got a short video I want you to watch. I think it's about three minutes long of, of Josh McDowell talking about that the subject is this a, a strong case for reliability, the reliability of the Bible, fact or fiction. To just sort of watch this video. It's amazing when you look at so many of the scholars and their opinions about the accuracy of the transmission of the scriptures and their datings and all. Uh, a number of them were very contrary uh, to the conclusions that it's reliable, it's trustworthy, or early dating. But so many of them, when they would examine it, would change their opinion. For example, uh, Robinson, who was a lecturer at Trinity College in Cambridge, he accepted the consensus that the New Testament was written way later into the second century. And he, he thought that was a scholarly conclusion. But as little more than actually in his own words as a theological joke, just to make a joke of it, he decided to investigate the arguments of the dating of all the books of the New Testament. And to his amazement and to his honesty, and I want to read this, he said, the results stunned me. Owing to scholar sloppy, scholarly sloppiness, the tyranny of unexamined assumption, and the almost willful blindness by previous authors. He went on to say, much of the past reasoning was untenable. And he concluded that the New Testament, now here's one of the greatest liberals saying it was written way in the second century. He concluded the New Testament is a work of the apostles themselves or of contemporaries who worked with them, and they concluded that every single book of the New Testament was written before 70 A.D. Folks, it is trustworthy. Mayor Burroughs of Yale University said, another result of comparing New Testament Greek with the language of the papyri is an increase of confidence in the accurate transmission of the text of the New Testament itself. The text has been transmitted with remarkable fidelity. He went on to say, so there need be no doubt whatever regarding the teachings conveyed by them. And Dr. Howard Baus uh, made this statement. The case for the reliability of the New Testament is infinitely stronger than that for any other record of antiquity. Dr. Voss's conclusion is the same conclusion I came to after trying to refute it all. That if I could not trust the New Testament, then I'd have to throw out all literature of antiquity and become a total historic agnostic. Now again, I know some of that may seem like it was, uh, <laughs> you know, when I, when I hear that, I'm like, some of you are like, okay, wow, well, what's all exactly is he saying? Uh, but I will tell you this, one statement he did, he didn't make it in this video, but a statement that I have of his, Josh McDowell said this, he says, the Bible is unique, which means it is different from all others, having no like or equal. It has no like or equal. I believe many times that we truly fail to understand and know this fact. There is no other book that is the Word of God except the Bible. Many others claim to be so, but when they're truly put to the test, they fail. They fail miserably. Do so you understand that you know, the Bible was written over a span of about 1,500 years, 1,500 years by, by about 40 different authors, but yet it combines together for one Theme, for the same theme carries throughout it all. You know what that theme is? Throughout it all? Jesus. Is the Messiah. The Bible was given to us. Yes, it conveys a lot of different things. But, but, but behind everything that is being conveyed, it is conveying the fact that there is a Messiah. Oh, it's pointing to who? Pointing to Jesus. See, the Old Testament points to Him and the New Testament reveals who Jesus is. It reveals who the Messiah is. Um, but what he was 
saying on there is, is that when, when you compare the, and I'm going to say this a little later on the message, what's available to us to, to help us understand how accurate and how reliable the Bible is, the amount of transcripts that are available to us far exceeds anything else of any other history books by miles. And, and I'll touch that a little bit later on. So in other words, he's saying this can be, we can know that the Bible we have is is true. It's been, it's been reliable. I'm going to touch it here in a little bit. But I want you to think about some statements. I'm going to read some statements to you. And, and, I, and I'm going to ask you a question about it once I read them. Okay? The Bible says that God helps those who help themselves. According to the Bible, the earth is flat. Cleanliness is next to godliness is in the Bible. The Bible teaches us that the earth is the center of the universe. The earliest New Testament manuscripts go back only to the 4th or 5th centuries A.D. The books of the New Testament were written centuries after the events they described. The early, the, I'm sorry, the English Bible is a translation of a translation of a translation and so on and so on of the original and fresh errors were introduced in each stage of this process. Now again, how many of these statements you think I read are true? No. Yeah. Every single one I read to you are false. Mm -hmm. Every single statement I read to you are false. See, yet these false impressions persist in the minds of many, and this information like this produces a skeptical attitude towards the Bible. See, when I made those statements, but, but again, how many ever heard people think that these kind of statements are in the Bible, that cleanliness is next to God? Or that, or you know, because again, you, they, they try to teach the Bible says that the earth was flat, and the earth does it. But if you if you really read it, 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 it was one of the first writings of of ancient history that, that talks about a circumference of something going around the, the, the circuit, you know. And uh, so, yeah. So so we're, we're we are discussing these objections to the action reliability of the Bible to help you make a more informed decision as to if the Bible is reliable. Or not. Okay, so understand. So all this here, I want you. To, I want you to understand is, you know, um, we, we, we don't we don't believe in just some old book, but but, but we can, we can trust it. Because again, one of the biggest things you hear is that you know someone you know how can you be sure that the Bible that you have now is the same as when it was written? How, how can we know that if we pick up if I grab my, I don't carry my, my my hard Bible anymore? I don't have it up here. But how do you know if you, if you open the Bible? and you look at it, or you open up a Bible app and start reading the translations that are in there, how can you know it is the same Bible that was written years ago, that it hasn't um, been just, had a whole bunch of errors? So what I want to do, I'm, I'm going to try to see how we can sort of do this this morning. I, I was going to do a little bit of experiment. Have you ever heard the, um, what's it, it's called, the, the telephone game? Yeah. Where basically I, I, I tell somebody something and I have them pass it around. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that necessarily would be a good idea this, in this age of, of what they're doing, our social distancing. Um, I could try it on the first pew with my family and see whether or not they'll get it right. And then this way we'll see what happens. And if anything, maybe I'll go back to the other pew back there where those five are sitting together and try it with them and see if they, see if they get it right. You want to try this and see? What, you? No, you won't. <laughs> well, try your best to get this right. Okay? All right. So, same if you would, I'm going to come here. I'm going to whisper in your ear. Okay? So, guys, you're on, on, you'll, later on, I'll tell you what it says. Okay? So, all right. All right. <clears throat> Listen carefully.
Good. Do what you think. Go ahead. All right. Tell to Jordan. Now Jordan said, oh, well, well she's got passing man, and man's going to tell him. Good. But here's, here, here's, here's what I shared with Sammy. I said the F-22 Raptor is a single engine, is a single seat, twin engine aircraft, super maneuverable aircraft that uses stealth technology. Okay? That, that, that's, what, that's what I said. But again, you know, they, 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 they got the part, the F-22 was an air fighter, fighter aircraft, right? Or just aircraft. Fighter jets. Okay. All right. So we're gonna try this one more time. Okay. All right. Which, which, Will? Do you want to be the one passing, or you want to be the one to receive? All right. Wow. We're doing this for a reason. Okay, go ahead. that sentence got distorted. How, I mean, some, you know, John, out of that sentence, John Hancock and Signature came out, okay? Yeah. But not the whole thing. Right. Right? And that the F-22 Raptor is a fighter jet, uh, that came out, but it wasn't everything about it. And of course, that's what people say about, you know, if all of this stuff was oral tradition, if it's passed on orally, you know, we know, we know if it was passed on orally, we know that all of the mistakes that would have to be in this because we know from one story to the next, who had, who's ever had someone tell them a story and you, you were intrigued with it? So you said, let me go share the story with somebody else. But by the time, again, that's what this says, by the time the story gets back to the red, original the, the, the original giver, all of a sudden now they're, they're Superman who, 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 uh, who, who ran faster than, 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 than the speeding train and stronger than a locomotive, you know? <laughs> But, but it started out as, hey, I, I, you know, I shot, I shot a bullet that was going fast, and I rode on a train. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you know, so people, they, they, they sometimes they, 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 they just ask, you know, because of this, how do, how do we know that the Bible is reliable? 
See, but see, but their error, a lot of their error is too that, that, that they think of, that they, they try to think of, of like, again, the telephone game, and, and if anything, even if it was done orally, it wasn't done that way, but we know that the Bible was written down. We know it was, it was written down, and then the purpose of writing down, like for instance, if I would have told them, I thought about doing this, but I can't because my phone's being used for um, a lie. But I thought about what I could do is do one group where I sit there and say, okay, here it is. I, I'm going to give you, I'm going to say it to you, I'm going to whisper it in your ear. The other group, I'm going to text you it. And I'm going to text you it. Now take that text and pass it on. Well, first off, unless you're, unless you're, um, yeah, uh, challenge, you'll be able to copy that text and paste it on other people. And because you're copying the original text, everything you pass on after that will be, unless you decide to add something to it, everything, every, every time you pass it on, it will be what? An exact duplicate of what I originally sent you because you have the ability. There it is. Let me copy, paste it, send it on. You know that from the original text that I would send, it would be the same text going out, unless somehow, in some way, Samsung or Apple, all of a sudden it bends code said, well, let's mess with this text message a little bit. Let's change it. Let, let's autocorrect the paste, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, 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 you know, but sometimes people ask this question because, you know, I said, by just doing this little test, you can see how just verbally going down quickly, it got messed up. Is that something like uh, when, with the Mary Magdalene thing, where it went so far where they said she was a prostitute, and then later on in the 7th century they changed it? No, to the best of my knowledge, uh, it, I, whether or not she's a prostitute, that I really don't know how to do some research. I, we do, we do know that um, she was, um, at, it's believed, I think, Mary Magdalene, she was at least, at least the woman who, I think, he cast seven demons, seven demons out of, yeah. I think. Uh, but, but again, maybe how she got the money, because again, the, the perfume she had, what the perfume she had, the ointment, the alabaster box that they talked about, that, that she put over him for his burial, at, on his feet, uh, that was something that was very expensive. Where that came from, I'm not sure. Uh, I know there's been speculation that, that, that she was a prostitute, but again, I would have to do more research like, on that. Like a change, you know, I, I just seen that last week on the History Channel, the Bible, and something like this, but this is something that you're talking about, right? Right, right. right. And, and here's the thing, understand, you know, as they study the Bible, when, when they find, if they find where, where, and I would say, it's not that the Bible is wrong, because it's not, right. but, but they can find other things that, that, that change what tradition says. Yeah. See, we're, we're talking about traditional history versus what actually, what, the Bible says, okay, and, and that's the thing is you know because it's like for instance I use this I know I'm sorry but since you asked a question let me say this real quick I know a lot of times people ask a question like for instance you've heard me I, I've said and I'm saying it today I do not believe that Jesus fell on the way of the cross because again read the four Gospels read any account of the crucifixion nowhere absolutely nowhere do you read that he fell under the weight of the cross. cross. It may be logical to assume so right. since he was beaten so badly and he was carrying the cross and Simeon was called to carry his cross after him. Now it may be logical to think so, but it is not biblical to say so. Right. Because nowhere do you read in the scripture that Jesus fell on the way of the cross. And my personal opinion, I'm sure, but my personal opinion is that he did not fall under the weight of the cross because if he would have fell under the weight of the cross, then that means that he would have needed mankind to help him pay the price for mankind. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, my, my, my person, again, I can't prove this the same as they can't prove that he fell under the weight of the cross. But my personal opinion is either one of two things happened. Either the soldier had compassion on Jesus or he was mocking him more. You know, because again, we can't prove this anywhere, but very, I can put this this theory out there very easily. The the, the, the centurion that was taken to the cross, he said, "Oh, wait a second, guys, he's a king. He shouldn't be carrying his own cross." And he grabbed somebody out of the crowd to carry his cross. Mm -hmm. Or it could have been that this guy could have truly had compassion on Christ and had someone carry the cross for him. Now, again, I, if it's anything, I would think it's more so to mock him because. I understand Jesus had to do this on his own. 
Okay. But again, that, that, let's jump back into. Uh, uh, like I said, we got a little bit off the subject there. But do we need. But but how do, how do we know? How do we know the Bible we have today is reliable? Because understand this: the original writings of the Bible have been lost. But before they were lost, they were copied. Okay. These copies were incredibly accurate, very meticulous, and very precise. The people who copied them took great care when copying the original manuscripts. This copying method is so exact and so precise that the New Testament is considered to be 99.5% textually pure. That means that out of the 6,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, you understand, the New Testament was written in Greek, and of the additional 21,000 copies of other languages, there is only a half a percent of variation, which means it is very, very accurate. And, and, and again, um, like I said, did you hear the amount of copies available for comparison? There's a ton of them. And understand this, the closest book of literature of antiquity is Homer's Iliad, and it only has 600 copies. But the New Testament has over 6,000 Greek manuscripts and 21,000 others. I mean, just, just let that sink in a second. So it's light years above the others. The science of studying ancient literature and its accuracy, accuracy of transmission is called historicity. It's other words, history. Historicity, okay? The Bible is so, is so exceedingly accurate in its transmission from the originals to the present copies that if you compare it to any other ancient writing, the Bible is light years ahead in terms of number of manuscripts and accuracy. If the Bible were to be discredited as being unreliable, then it would be necessary to discard the writings of Homer, Plato, and Aristotle as also unreliable since there are far less of them preserved than the Bible. And also, understand this, I don't know if you, you listened to what Jonathan Dow was talking about that. When he was talking about the New Testament, he says, when you do a study of it, 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 when they truly do a true study of it, the writings of the New Testament are, are the oldest one is dated back to no later than 70 AD. In other words, the destruction of Jerusalem. So in other words, within 35 to 40 years of Christ being here on this planet and leaving. Within that amount of time. Do you all know what the average span of history books of antiquity are from the time of when an event happened to when it was written down? Does anybody know what the time span is? Like I said, the New Testament's within 40 years. So, so the, the, the information we get like on ancient Greece and ancient Rome and all the, the history of the Greeks and the Romans and early history of the world, do, do, the earliest copies, do you know how far from the time when those things happened to, to when the earliest copy is that talks about them? The closest one was within a thousand years. So it was passed. So, so the, it was it was written down a thousand years after the events. The New Testament was done within forty years. And they always say, again, you talk to these scholars. The closer it, the account is written down to that time period, the more trustworthy that account is. So again, so understand how 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 much we, especially the Newton, how how much we, we we can trust these things. So you understand that the Bible is written by those who are inspired by God. It so it is accurate and true, and represents historical occurrences. When we look at the New Testament, we realize that it was written by those who either knew Jesus personally, meaning they were eyewitnesses or were under the direction of those who were eyewitnesses. Remember, that's something that Josh talked about in the video, didn't he? That that's how close these three the writers were. They wrote what they saw. They wrote about the resurrection of Christ, and they recorded his miracles and saying, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1-4 through 4 says this, We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And we now testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. 
we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with our Father, is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Others are saying, we have written these things because we are eyewitnesses. And of course, you know, I said about the New Testament, you know, people say, well, what about the Old Testament? But we know that was written a while ago. But again, that's when, you know, back in, in, in the 40s and the 50s, when they discovered a thing called, in, in Quran, they, they were called what? The Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls, they were dated. They had been dated, actually dated to be at least 300 B.C. So, 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 so they date back to 300 B.C. 300 years, at least when it was where Christ came. And when you compare the writings that they found in the Dead Sea Scroll to what we have in the modern day Bible, again, it fits within this 99.5% accuracy. So we know that the scholars definitely took their time to make sure that what they copied, they did other than say, well, you know what, I don't like what God says here or what Moses said there or whatever, so let me, let me change it up a little bit. They truly transcribe what was here to here. Again, with the text message, when I send it to you, you can sit there and say, you know what, let me copy, let me paste it, but wait a second, I really don't like what Pastor says here, so let me interject something. You could do that, but if anybody got a hold of the original, they would see that it what has been changed. This is what like the Dead Sea Scrolls show to give us that, because like I said, they were dated back to 300 B.C. So you're talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls now are 2,300 plus years old. And yet, the book of Isaiah, I think it's the book of Isaiah that's in there. I think it's what it is. Um, I forget exactly. Whatever book it is, it, it, it is basically verbatim to what we have today. So, so understand that they, they did, they, they were very meticulous in what they wrote down. See, the Bible has endured time, has endured time, critics, and persecution, and guess what? It is still here. Countries have tried to wipe it off the face of the planet, and guess what? It is still here. Why? Because it is the Word of God. And I'm going to touch, go back to the verse we read a little bit earlier to open up uh, our service today. See, I, these eyewitnesses were not in it for self-glory or for riches. Because remember, I told you, the majority of the disciples, what happened to them? They died martyrs' deaths. They died awful deaths. So when we compare any book of antiquity, the Bible blows its competition away when you compare it to it. It literally blows it away, that, the fact that it can be reliable, that it can be counted on. So I want to close with a couple of thoughts here. But it comes, but here, here's, you know, even though I can lay this out to you, even though Josh McDowell, different ones, can lay out to you and show you that we can know that the Bible we have today was we did the same type of scriptures they would have had back then. In fact, one of the videos I watched of Josh McDowell talked about, he says, in the world today, if we were to literally destroy every single copy of the Bible today, of the New Testament, he could recreate it and be missing 11 verses. Because we have enough papers from early church fathers that have survived that contain enough scripture in the New Testament that they could literally redo the entire New Testament except for 11 verses. So even if the Bible itself got destroyed, there's enough writings in antiquity which have enough, like from sermons and other letters that they sent to other churches, church fathers, to where they could recreate the New Testament only being missing 11 verses. 11 verses. That's mind blowing when you think about it. Our Bible, the Bible is reliable. But again, it comes down to whether or not you believe what it says. What it says about life, guidance, and ultimately Christ the Messiah, Jesus. It comes down to whether or not you believe it or not. It, as always, it's your choice. It's, it's up to you. You can simply say, yep, I agree with it, or I think it's a bunch of fooey. Or hooey. <laughs> hooey, hooey. Hooey, hooey, hooey. It's hooey. It's hooey. It's hooey. All right? But the question is, do you? And here's the thing. If only people would truly sit down and read the Bible from cover to cover, 
they would see it is not an ordinary book. You've heard me say this before. I'm trying to hurry up here. You've heard me say this before. When people tell you, well, you know what? I don't like the Bible. I don't like what it says. I don't believe in it. I'm going to give you my own simple response of what you can tell them. Simply, I say, well, can I ask you a question? Say, what do you like about telling someone not to steal? What do you dislike about telling someone not to lie, but to be honest? What, what don't you like about telling someone be faithful in your marriage? In other words, don't cheat on your husband. Don't cheat on your wife. What don't you like about that? What, what, what don't you like about not wanting what someone else has that you'll almost do anything to get it? See, and those, and those are just touching some of the Ten Commandments. What exactly about that don't you like? And of course, well, it's not that. It's say, but you need to understand that's really what the Bible entails. It entails the whole Bible summed up as Jesus says in the two greatest commands. What are those commands? The first command is this, what to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And the second greatest commandment is what to love your neighbor as yourself. The whole essence of the Bible is tied up in those two verses. What exactly about those two verses don't you like? Of course, they're going to have a problem with number one. But they have a problem with number two. They have issues. And that truly is the message and the essence of the Bible. But I'm going to read to you real quick as we close some verses of what what God's Word says about God's Word. Okay? What God's Word says about God's Word. We open with these two portions of Scripture in our service today. Psalms 40, verse, verse 8 says, The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. That's what it declares. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your Word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 says, all Scripture is inspired by God. It is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what to do, what is right. God uses, uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. In other words, what's in the Bible is designed for what? Our good and the good of others. Hence, love your neighbor as yourself. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. In other words, the Bible cuts right through all the gum, through all the junk, and gets right to the heart of the matter. And again, now I think that's why people don't necessarily like the Bible. But I love what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119. I mean Psalms 19. Psalms 19, verses 7 through 14. Listen to how the Word of God is described. It says, The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. See, a lot of people like to argue with that, but you know what? They are fair. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. They are a warning to your servants, a great reward for those who obey them. How can I know all the sins lurking in my heart? Cleanse me from these hidden faults. Keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. And then verse 14 says, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. But it describes the Word of God here as something that is very precious and dear. And how, by, by having receiving it in, how your life is literally changed by this Word. And that is true. Because you just think about it. If, 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 if our world, if our world, which is truly 
even if they didn't want to follow the greatest commandment. But you really can't follow the great. You can't do the second greatest commandment without doing the first. But but even if they could, if, if if our world would just do what the second greatest commandment is, how different would our world be if people would love their neighbor as themselves? If they truly put the needs of someone else above their own. We have a problem with human trafficking and, and abortion and everything else due to the fact that people are selfish and greedy. Because it's all about me, me, me. Wars are fought over me. How much different would this world be if truly people love other people like they love themselves? You know, as the gold rule says, do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself. Now that is rooted and grounded. That is rooted and grounded in Scripture. But not cleanliness is next to godliness. The Bible is reliable. We can know that the book we have today has been, has been copied from when it was originally done till now. And it is we have that same copy. It is accurate. It is reliable. But it all comes down to whether or not if you believe and receive what it says. But again, just the teachings in it should speak to its divine authorship of just how it's truly about treating others right. Putting self aside. Amen. I'm asking our musicians to come. But we want to close out uh, to just worshiping the Lord a little bit today. Uh, this really isn't a uh, uh, come find Jesus moment. Maybe it is. If it's supposed to be that way, then by all means, I don't want to say, uh, I, I don't feel depressed as that. But again, if God has spoken to you through this, hey, all of a sudden the light bulb went off. Say, oh, man, I understand God's word. is. It, it, I can trust this stuff. And I, I need to pay attention to what it says. And, and God's speaking by all means. Call out to the Lord Jesus. Say, Lord, here I am. You know, but by, by, you know, I realize all this other stuff I was believing a lot. And as I see this, I now see that truly your word is true. And just reveal in your word to me that truth. Yes, if you speak that way, definitely just call out to him today. But I just want, again, I just felt to me that we need to talk about, we can know, we can rely upon this Bible. We can say it's not, it's not full of errors. It's not full of contradictions. It hasn't been changed over time. Because when we look at old findings, we see that what was written back 2,300 years ago in the Dead Sea Scrolls is the same thing that's in our Bible today. That, that, that lets us know we pretty much trust what's in there. That they, that they didn't say, well, I didn't like what was said here, so I'm going to change something. They kept it. They, they were very uh, serious about copying it exactly. But what I do want you to know is that God loves you. And, and, his, and his word, the Bible, is his love letter to you. It's his, it's his owner's manual, as, as Will put it, it's the owner manual to, owner's manual to how life should be lived and for your life to, to help you know him more and to experience life in its fullest. That's what the Bible is. It isn't there to tell you, uh, it isn't there to tell you you're off or whatever, but it's there to reveal the love of God through Jesus. And that's what I want you to receive this morning. And because of that, we can sing a song and say, Lord, I love you, Lord. Lord, I, I look to you. I trust in you. And I just want to, I just want to say, I just want to declare my love for you once again. So if you would stand with us this morning. And we just wanted to sing some songs of praise to him as we end up time together. But again, I hope, hope you receive some information on this thing. Again, this is stuff you sort of be playing the back of your brain. Because again, I want you to prepare if someone asks you a question. You can give them a reason, a reason for your hope, a reason why you believe this. And I know the Holy Spirit will move upon you to lead God and direct you in that. But let's just spend some time just praising His name before we leave this place today. See this and say, Amen.